Bears are the epitome of the power and beauty of wildlife. However, what happens when that power collides with humans? Today, we're going to delve into the world of bear attacks on humans. Moments when an encounter with these wild animals takes a terrifying turn. Click the like button and subscribe now. In today's episode, we'll look at three cases. When people found themselves one step away from death, the welcome to wild assault. Seishi Sato had an ominous feeling when he saw something rustling in the bushes during a recent walk through the forest in northern Japan. Seishi slowed his step and tensely looked around at his surroundings. The wind whispered in the trees, creating a mysterious and rustling sound. Animals and insects added a note of liveliness to this gloomy place. The sense of unease increased when he heard the rustling again. He walked a few more steps and froze in place, squinting his eyes. Now he was sure he was not mistaken. Something was inside the bushes. He slowly approached the bushes and carefully pushed the branches apart. He saw a small clearing covered with falling leaves, but what he saw made his heart sink. On a cold December day in 2023, Seishi Sato went to the neighboring Iwazumi forest to pick fresh mushrooms. Seishi loved spending time outdoors, especially in these scenic areas. He hoped his luck wouldn't fail him this time. During his time in the forest, Seishi had received a flyer warning of possible bear attacks. However, since he had been in the forest many times before and had not encountered such situations, he disregarded the warning, not realizing that life was trying to warn him. Seishi continued to walk through the forest, disregarding the warning about bears. He was sure that nothing bad would happen, because nothing like this had ever happened before. But that was his big mistake. As he traveled further down the trail, Seishi noticed a strange movement in the bushes. He stopped and tried to see what was going on. But it was too late. What would happen next terrified him. A bear came out of the bushes and ran straight at Seishi. Seishi didn't have time to react, and the bear knocked him down. They rolled over with the mushroom baskets and ended up in the mud. There were two of them, but only one attacked him. The other he never saw again. Seishi felt a sharp pain in his leg when the bear bit him. He realized he had to defend himself somehow. Seishi took a stick he found nearby and began to fight off the bear. He tried to throw punches at the bear, but the beast was much stronger. The bear kept coming at Seishi despite his desperate attempts to defend himself. Seishi realized that defending himself with a stick was not giving him enough protection, so he decided to take drastic measures. He concentrated and gradually stopped panicking. Seishi began thinking about possible ways to stop the bear. Remembering his survival skills, he decided to use his environment to his advantage. Around Seishi were dirt and mushroom baskets that could come in handy in a fight with the bear. He jumped to his feet abruptly and, ignoring the pain, grabbed one of the baskets. Throwing it in the bear's direction, Seishi diverted its attention. The bear, hearing the noise the thrown basket made, spun around trying to figure out what it was. He continued to throw other objects to keep the bear's attention and divert it from his path. Gradually, with each object thrown, Seishi moved further away from the bear. He knew he needed to stay in plain sight, so the bear wouldn't corner him or take him by surprise. He continued to bounce around in the grass and throw anything that could serve as a distraction. When the bear stopped showing interest in the thrown objects, Seishi felt relatively safe and decided to continue on his way to the nearest tree. He continued to be cautious, looking back every now and then to make sure the bear wasn't following him. Unfortunately, however, luck was not on his side today, as he noticed the bear showing interest in him again and started moving towards him. Seishi quickened his step and began to sprint towards the nearest tree. He could feel the tension filling his body and his heart began to beat even faster. The bear was gigantic and fast-footed, so Seishi realized that he needed to act quickly and decisively. He ran as fast as he could, heading for the tree with all his might. The bear was coming closer and closer, its heavy paws thundering on the ground. Seishi felt the bear getting closer and closer to him. When Seishi finally reached the tree, he didn't hesitate to start climbing up, trying to escape onto a high branch. 
Fear and adrenaline coursed through his body and he could barely contain the trembling of his legs. The bear approached the tree and roared, grinning viciously. Seishi felt he lacked the strength to climb higher and his heart began to falter. But he didn't give up. He took the last of his strength in his fist and kept climbing despite the hardships. The bear rushed towards the tree, growling and clawing at the trunk. He tried to get at Sishi, displaying his sharp claws and opening his mouth. Even though the bear was still able to strike at his leg, he was able to climb up the tree. Seishi pulled out his cell phone and dialed the emergency number. He described his situation and location, asking for help as soon as possible. The bear continued to growl furiously and bang against the tree, trying to reach Seishi. He looked down anxiously, realizing that it was only a matter of time before the bear could reach him. Finally, help pulled up. The rescuers arrived by car and they quickly approached the area where Seishi was in the tree. They quickly assessed the situation and aimed a flashlight at the bear in an attempt to divert its attention. Seizing the moment, Seishi climbed down the tree using a special rope that the rescuers threw to him. He was grateful to them for their promptness and rescue. The bear, seeing the approach of people, began to retreat, not wanting to confront them. The rescuers quickly approached Seishi and assured him that everything would be okay. Seishi was very grateful to the rescuers and realized that without their help, he could have died. This incident left a deep imprint in him, and he will never forget again how important it was to call for help in a critical situation. As time passed, the marks from the attack gradually healed, and Seishi began to slowly return to his normal life. He continued to follow the doctor's recommendations. The end of 2023 is still a month away, but the total number of attacks this year has already far exceeded the 158 that occurred in all of 2020, the previous record year. And the number of bear attacks has never exceeded 200 per year since the count began in 2006. However, experts say that Japanese bears are increasingly leaving their traditional habitats and entering urban areas in search of food. Some speculate that this is because climate change is interfering with flowering and pollination of some of the animal's traditional food sources. Experts say when bears attack, the reason is usually because the mother bear fears that a human encounter poses a threat to her cub. Sato recalls that the Asian bears he encountered were like mother and cub. This year, bears have become more frequent in the villages precisely because there has been a very poor harvest of acorns from the beech tree, the bear's favorite tree. Joshua Berg, 17, of New City, North Carolina, the group's elected leader and most accomplished outdoorsman, Noah Allaire, 16, of Albuquerque, New Mexico, a lifeguard and gifted student who skipped two classes in high school and will start college in the fall. Sam Gottsagen, 17, the Gotzi in the group, from Denver, an avid snowboarder, friendly and quiet. Sam Melman, 17, volunteers in the intensive care unit of a New York City hospital. Victor Martin, 18, a muscular basketball player from a tough neighborhood in Richmond, Calip. Uh, Shane Garlock, 16, from Pittsburgh, New York, a photographer and cross-country runner. And Sam Boas, 16, of Westport, Connecticut, an avid cook and certified emergency medical responder. They are students at the prestigious National Outdoor Leadership School, taking a month-long course during summer vacation after high school graduation. They spent 24 days hiking in the rugged western Talkeetna Mountains with three instructors, learning leadership and outdoor skills, including first aid. They are now about 40 miles northeast of the nearest town of Talkeetna, separated from any sign of human habitation by miles of rugged, roadless terrain. This is the last leg of the journey, where the students will have to find their own way to a railroad track 24 miles from town where they will meet their instructors in three days. Until then, they have no way to contact their instructors or the outside world. They are truly alone. Before the boys set off, one of the instructors looked at them and, grinning, gave them this advice. Don't die. They walk alone straight into the cold water using the creek as a path, for the ground here is covered with thickets of alder and willow that make movement almost impossible. Berg, Gotzigan, and Allaire walk ahead. The creek is easier to follow than the ground. 
but it is full of turns, some of them so steep you can't see where you're going. Berg rounds one such bend and sees that just 30 feet in front of him is a bale of hay. He only has time to turn around and yell, Bear! Before a grizzly closes the space between them, rises up on his hind legs, he's seven feet tall and weighs about 500 pounds, pounces and flattens him. With a terrifying roar, he heads straight for Berg's head and cracks his skull open with a crack. The others scream and scatter. According to grizzly protocol, they've been trained to stand still, but this is too close, too sudden, too violent, and the bear is too big, too loud, too real. The ground rumbles every time he presses his paws to the ground. They don't even have time or opportunity to get the bear repellent the three of them carry with them. There is a ridge on the right side of the creek, and most of the boys climb it through the brush. Berg's terrified cry causes Sam Gottsagen to stop and look back at his friend. The bear still holds Berg's bloody head in its teeth and shakes the 180-pound boy like a flag, digging its claws into his torso. Alaire hides on the left bank about 30 feet below. Garlock, Melman, and Boas are higher up on the hill, some of them screaming in panic, huddled under scrubby willows. Gottsagen is faced with a dilemma. Do he run to his friend, who is being attacked by a grizzly bear and essentially sacrifice himself, or run in the opposite direction? But it doesn't matter, because now the bear is hurtling toward Gottsagen, its muzzle furiously twisted. A light brown blur so fast that Gottsagen only has time to take a couple steps before the bear crashes into him. He falls to the ground, rolls over, and rises to his knees with a scream. But the bear growls, grabs his head with its teeth, and there is another loud crunch. Gottsagen somehow breaks free and scurries away a few steps. But the bear straightens him out again, biting him on the arm, digging into his neck, chest, arm, and back, and sinking its claws into his rib cage with enough force to puncture a lung. If a bear attack were filmed in Hollywood, close-ups would show the animal's ferocious eyes, its breath would fog the lens, and we would see the terrible fangs closing in. The reality is more like what you'd see if the camera was slammed to the ground from behind with force and then kicked around in the bushes for 30 seconds. Maybe a glimpse of fur, but mostly it would be blind confusion. You're being overpowered by an animal that reaches 30 miles per hour and is capable of taking down a smaller elk or caribou. There are surprisingly few pain endorphins produced, and you hear your own skull crunching and think, where's the pain? Your whole life may not be passing before your eyes, but one part of you is busy trying to convince the other that you're about to die. There comes a moment of calm. The bear has disappeared and Berg's screams have been replaced by moans. Alaire is still hiding on the bank. He gazes into the hillside. Garlock and Boas are hunched over, refusing to look, and Melvin stands watching with wide open eyes. Alaire looks into Garlock's eyes and asks, where's the bear? Alaire is silent. Garlock gives an exaggeratedly flippant shrug. Aller slips out of his backpack and runs forward to help Berg. The bear bursts out of nowhere and catches up to him, nearly scalping him with the first swing of its paw. The bear digs into Alaire's torso, lower teeth at the back, upper teeth under his armpit, lifts him three feet off the ground in its jaws and shakes him, growling and snarling, then drops him. Now it rises again on its hind legs, astonishingly tall, as if ready to lower its front paws and finish Aller off. But it hesitates when it notices Boas, Melman and Garlock on the hill. It leaps over the bleeding Allaire and runs away. But then it bumps into Martin, standing near Gottsagen, and grabs his left calf with its teeth. Martin somehow breaks free and the grizzly scurries off over the hill. He's gone, yelled Melman. A cold rain begins to fall. Beacon, beacon. Berg is alive and crawling to his backpack, which contains an emergency personal beacon that transmits their GPS coordinates via satellite to the Alaska Rescue Coordination Center. Alaire gets up, wobbly and bleeding, and runs to Berg. Take the beacon, Berg says. Melman and Boas come down the hill to help. Boas places Berg's mangled head in his lap and tells his friend not to move. Neither of them has ever used a lighthouse before, so they wipe Alaire's blood off the laminated instructions and study it together. There's a red plastic latch that needs to be removed, and it jams quickly. They wrestle with it until it breaks. 
Using Garlock's favorite blade knife, which he nicknamed Betsy, they release the plastic tab. The beacon opens and the uh, antenna unfolds. Someone presses the power button and the group huddles over the device, watching the LED display to make sure their GPS coordinates are set. Gotsigan stumbled into a small clearing and fell there, crying out for help, his torso pierced in several places. After examining Gotsigan's wounds, Aller is surprised to find a sucking wound on his chest. The bear's claw had passed between Gotsigan's ribs and penetrated his chest cavity, puncturing a lung. Now, with each breath, Gotsigan sucks in wind through the hole in his torso, and air-filled blood bubbles to the surface. If the wound is not treated properly, the second lung will collapse, and Gotsigan will die. Alaire tears open a garbage bag and places a piece of plastic over the wound, creating an airtight seal, then wraps an elastic bandage around Gotsi's torso and continues to apply pressure to the dressing, a standard field treatment for such a wound, crucial to stabilizing the air pressure in the chest cavity. Sam Boas is still holding Joshua Berg's head, trying to give it and his back a stable position, in case he suffered a brain or spinal cord injury. Berg was completely destroyed by the bear. His legs are numb, his skull is fractured, and the flesh on his head has been shredded with such force that he is unrecognizable. He is bleeding everywhere. They set up a tent. The group huddles on the ground to wait for help, rain pounding on the tent roof. Hours pass, and the temperature drops to 50 degrees. A coarse shiver hits everyone. The flashing of a beacon periodically gives a glimpse of the walls and floor of the tent, smeared and drenched with the boys' mixed blood. A little after 2 a.m., more than five hours after the bear attack, the tent is illuminated by the blinding light of a searchlight, and its walls tilt in the flow of water from the rotor. A Hilo 1 A-Star helicopter lands among the bushes about 30 yards from the tent, and an Alaska State Police trooper climbs down and approaches the tent. The trooper is a transplanted New Zealander named Michael Shelley. He assesses the situation and decides that the small airplane doesn't have enough room for everyone. It's also not equipped for severely injured patients like Gotzegen and Berg. Shelley insists that Garlock and the walking wounded, Aller and Martin, go with the pilot. The boys have to decide which of them will stay with Shelley, Gotzegen and Berg to wait for a larger helicopter to evacuate them. Melman volunteers, but for Sam Boas, the EMT who has stayed close to Berg all these hours, there's no doubt he'll be the one to stay. Minutes later, the others tearfully say goodbye to their friends, saying words to each other that most guys wouldn't dream of saying, like, I love you. Three hours later, eight hours into their ordeal, an Alaska Air National Guard Sikorsky HEH-60 Pavhawk helicopter rumbles to a thunderous landing next to the tent. Seconds later, elite pararescue men in helmets burst into the tent and begin working on Berg and Gottsagen transferring them into orange, insulated rescue bags. One of the crew members leads Boas out of the tent and into the helicopter. Soon, Gottsagen, Berg, and Shelley are in the helicopter with him. The helicopter rises upward as if on a string. Boas takes one last look at the wreckage of the campground below and flies away. It's only 12 minutes since the helicopter landed, and now they're hurtling through mountains that took his group weeks to traverse on foot. The small, temporary campground once again, an insignificant speck on the steep bend of an unnamed creek in the incomprehensibly vast Alaskan bush. The bear was never found, and the reason for his attack is still a mystery. Perhaps it was defending its kill site or a cub. Whatever the reason, experts were stunned. Grizzlies almost never attack a group of more than four people. All the boys survived. Victor Martin was treated for a bite on his leg and released. Sam Gottsigan suffered broken ribs and his lung required reinflating. His chest cavity was punctured in not one but three places. He spent eight days in the hospital and is now almost fully recovered. He even snowboarded in the winter. Uh, surgeons worked on Joshua Berg's head for eight hours, inserting a titanium plate and bone graft into the boy's skull. In total, Berg spent 20 days in the hospital. He is now feeling well and his appearance has not changed much, but scars remain. Noah Allaire required scalp fusion surgery. Doctors discovered that one of his lungs had been punctured by a bear tooth, but although some air had leaked out, it had healed on its own. 
From his hospital bed, Allaire spoke to his parents, Patricia Allaire and Scott Newland. They had already talked to the police, but all they knew was that there had been a bear attack and Noah was injured. The story begins with a sense of joy and optimism, but one encounter with a big and scary creature that almost killed Jorik changes everything. Southeast Alaska is known for its beautiful mountains, great ski slopes, and plenty of snow. Yorick and his friends enjoy making the most of this winter fairy tale. They have rented a cozy cottage on the mountainside from where they can enjoy scenic views of the surrounding nature. They spend their days skiing the wide ski slopes, enjoying the speed and freedom they bring. Their technique gradually improves and they bravely tackle the different sections of the pipe. After a full day of skiing, they relax in the hot sauna, unwind and talk about their adventures on the mountainside. In the evening, they cook a delicious meal together, share experiences and laugh, creating a cozy atmosphere. A ski trip in southeast Alaska becomes an unforgettable experience for Yorick and his friends. One day, they set out on the farthest and most unexplored trail. They encounter a surprise. Kelvin, the name of one of the friends, sees someone's lair. Roma, the other friend, talked them out of it, but it didn't work out. They decided to take a closer look at the den and see who could be living in such a remote place. When they got closer, they discovered that it was the den of a bear. Realizing that it could be dangerous to be so close to a bear den, the boys moved cautiously. They realized that the brown bear is one of the largest mammals on the planet and has tremendous strength and power. However, despite the danger, their curiosity prompted them to look into the den. Suddenly, they noticed the presence of a small bear cub, and soon after, another one appeared. Suddenly, a huge bear cub, the size of a rock, came out of its hiding place. And when it saw the people, it started to attack. The bear lunged at Yorick in anger, launching an attack to protect her cubs. She struck him hard, covering him with her claws and teeth. Yorick tried to defend himself, but the bearess was strong and experienced. He dodged several blows and tried to shove her away, but the bearess was relentless. Her maternal instinct made her fight to the last drop of her strength. Yorick screamed for help while his cowardly friends, not knowing how to help, tried to think of something. At that moment, Calvin came up with a stick and struck the bear, which caught her attention. She released Yorick from her grip and turned toward Kelvin. Anger and rage reflected in her eyes, and fear gripped all who witnessed the scene. They needed help more than ever, and Calvin knew he had to do something. He clutched the stick in his hand and raised it into the air with burning eyes, preparing to strike again, but suddenly it stopped and began to move backward. As the bear started to retreat back to her den to her cubs, she suddenly grabbed the injured Jorick. They need to act quickly to save their friend. Calvin quickly pulled out his phone and called the local emergency services to summon the professionals. Meanwhile, Roma decided to try and distract the bear from the injured man. Roma picked up a long stick and started waving it in front of the bear, creating noise and scaring it. Jorick started shouting as loudly as possible. Calvin and Roma, gathering all their strength, decided to approach the bear. Roma from behind and Calvin from the front. Finally, Calvin managed to distract the bear so much that she left Jorika and ran towards Calvin. At that moment, Roma dragged Jorika away. There was nothing left of Jorika's arm. He was bitten completely. Calvin found the nearest tree. He climbed it like a mountaineer. At that time, Kelvin felt tense because he realized that the bear could climb higher and get to him. He tried to hide on a thick branch to be safe. However, the bear continued circling the tree, sniffing the branches and making loud noises. Calvin decided that he needed to find a way to get out of here, eliminating the bear's ability to get him. He began to investigate the tree and found that there was another tree growing next to it that he could use to make the transition. By jumping up and grabbing branches, Calvin was able to climb over to the neighboring tree. However, it didn't help him. At that time, Roma was dragging Eureka as far as he could, but his strength was running out. Jorik began to lose consciousness. Roma tried to do everything possible to save him. But suddenly, Roma heard the sounds of a helicopter. It was a rescue team. Roma realized that they have a chance to save themselves. The crew saw Roma and Eureka. The helicopter approached a suitable place and then landed near us. 
There were five medics in it who immediately saw the injured Jorika and started to help him. At that time, Roma took a bear clap from the rescuers and immediately went to help Kelvin. He climbed a tree to hide from the bear. When he saw Calvin sitting in the tree and the angry bear, he used the clapper to scare the bear away. The noise and light from the clapper frightened the bear and she fled into the forest. Calvin quickly climbed down from the tree and they ran to the helicopter, looking around for the bear. Meanwhile, Yorick was completely immobilized and required specialized medical care. The helicopter crew used a special sport suspension to lift the injured skier. This suspension allows for the safe and efficient lifting and transportation of casualties in the air. After the injured man was hoisted aboard the helicopter, the crew immediately began giving him emergency medical treatment. They checked his pulse, blood pressure, and breathing and assessed the extent of his injuries. During the flight, the crew kept in constant communication with medical personnel on the ground to discuss further medical strategy and to get the necessary advice and instructions. The co-pilot, Lieutenant Captain Will Sardman, praised the crew members accompanying the casualty for the way they handled the situation, assisting the injured man and summoning help in the icy mountain. The helicopter transported the injured man to Juno, where he continues to receive treatment. The Coast Guard noted that he was in terrible condition. The other skiers were in excellent shape. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game cautioned the skiers, explaining that bears in the southeast region hibernate for a relatively shorter period of time than those in the north. Jorika was rescued, but he can no longer function normally with his arm, and his face has been disfigured beyond recognition. You should realize the importance of keeping your distance and caution when encountering bears. Bears are wild animals, and an encounter with them can be dangerous. There are bear sprays on the market that are designed to repel bears and prevent attacks on humans. These sprays contain active ingredients that have a pungent odor and an irritating effect on bears. To use such a spray, you need to aim it at the attacking bear in a cloud or straight stream. This will create a barrier that will deter the animal and prevent it from attacking or approaching a person. It is important to follow the instructions on how to use the spray and be prepared to communicate with the raider or other visitors, disclosing what sprays to use or to block or turn off. 